Anyway, hi, I'm Spiff. Welcome back to this game. Um, Stillwater. A good game. It's definitely not a yaoi hentai. Um, anyway. He's pulling his cock out! He's not pulling his cock out. What the hell? Damn it. Already? Oh my god, dear. I, I need to hurry or else. Hey, are you alright? Noah calls out to him, snapping him out of his fixated trance. Colby nudges his head against Hugo, whining with concern over his partner's well-being. Don't listen to Spiff, it's Yaoi! Oh, look at you on the three streams be- uh, uh, streak. Cheers. <clears throat> Did you hear that just now? Hear what? That voice. It was so close to my ear, I... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Is everything alright? Oh, I I'm fine. Uh, don't mind me. I'm just a bit winded out from the trip, that's all. Well, I'd be happy to make you some tea, at the very least. Oh, if it's no trouble. No, not at all. Um, it's the least I can do. Can we go inside? It's, it's raining. Nina, please. I'm getting so fucking drenched here. Woman, please. Once again, the subtle uneasiness from Nina surfaces. But before Hugo could get a chance to look further into it, she walked off towards the front porch without saying another word. You sure you're alright? You sounded like you were choking earlier. I said I'm fine. Besides, we're already here. We can't back out now. Listen to me, I, I think you should, um... Noah abruptly cuts his lecture short as he notices Nina stopping by the front door. She likes making me wet. I don't have a vagina. She stands by the door silently, contemplating something. It's just like before, but this time she seems even more anxious. Whatever unease she tried to mask earlier became more apparent the minutes they walked closer to the front door. I haven't been quite honest with you, detective. Huh? Just oh. fuck this game. Fuck video games in general. All, All video, video games, games suck. suck. Just like before. As if carefully choosing her next word, she decides that in this situation, words are not enough. You'll see for yourselves what I mean. I know that. Nina enters the house, leaving the three to follow behind. Water is not good lube, uncle. Wrong. He goes about to enter through the foyer when he feels a tug on his arm. Don't forget what I told you. If something happens, let me know right away. You'll be the first to know... And with that, Noah releases his grip on Hugo. They proceed to head in, not knowing what awaits them beyond the door. Greeted with a brightly lit hallway, Hugo notes immediately that the interior is just as grand. Adorned with floral accents and antique furnishings, the house itself exudes the word elegance. A classic and rustic charm with the walls and flooring made from the finest wood. Hugo couldn't help but gape when he walked in. Come on, game, you can't do this to me. You can't be using words like that in front of my chat. You know how they are. You can't be using words like that. God damn it. However, he notices something even more distinct than the splendor. Behind the seemingly perfect veneer, an unsettling air reads through the house, throughout the house, leaving no room for doubt that the inside is far more terrifying than the outside. Please, um, come this way. Racing themselves, they enter the dimly lit drawing room. At first glance, Hugo could not discern the silhouette situated at the far corner. Only the sparse lighting from the window pierces through a fraction of the room's darkness. However, as they approach closer to the silhouette, Hugo understands the reason for all of Nina's unsettling vagueness. Grandfather, we have guests. Oh my! Sitting on the armchair is a very young man, not much older than Hugo or Noah. He's dressed modestly and stares and shares none of the imposing presence of the manor. No, rather, such luxury does not even remotely reflect on the man before them all. It's as if the flow of time had stopped only for him, while the rest had continued changing drastically without him. Just like the letter, timeless, delicate, jarringly out of place. Staring 
Only at the window, the young man sits there dazed with little acknowledgement of the people around him. What the fuck? And I cannot emphasize this enough. What the fuck? It's very odd. This, is, this game is cool, man. Still. Motionless. Like a doll. Um, Grandpa? Uh, these are the people I spoke of. This is Detective Laurent and his two assistants. Uh, Colby and Noah. 10% increased Yowie? No. No foy. Bad. I need to get a fucking spray bottle and just spray chat every now and again when they're being horny. They're going to help us. Even after introducing them to the head of the Mortimer estate, Hugo and Noah could not help but feel unnerved. The man before them was supposed to be frail and older than any of them, yet here he remains forever unchanging. Forever young. Putting the fest into in- What? Oh yes, make us wet too, daddy. Oh my god, you guys. It's not gay if it's in a four-way. Except if all of the four people are men. Well, I know it's not in this- You guys need to stop. This is a very engaging story. It's a very cool game. Somebody put an insane amount of time and effort into the art and fucking the story and the music and everything and you guys are out here making incest jokes. Bad. Bad. Everyone must go to horny jail. They've come a long way, um, so I'll be making some tea. Uh, would you also like some, Grandpa? He does not reply back, nor does he glance at me, nor anyone else in the room. Only fixates his gaze on the rain. Nothing else. I'll be sure to make a cup for you too. He then timidly gestures to Hugo and Noah back to the foyer. Bearing more questions, the two follow Nina outside. Before they leave the drawing room, Hugo takes one last look at the young man. There is an all too familiar air about Henry Mortimer. His eyes are similar to his own. Whatever he must be longing for, Hugo knows that it will never end well. Nina, that man... Yes, he's my grandfather, the one I asked you to all watch over. I know this is hard to believe, but... Nina draws something out from her pocket. It's an old picture of a handsome man with slick back hair wearing the finest of suits. The gentleman in the picture has a different air to him, one of wealth and power. Jokes on you, you never left horny jail? Yeah, lifetime sentence. None of which reflects at all on the current Henry Mortimer. It's almost as if you're looking at two different people. This isn't much to go by, but believe me, they are the same person. Why does he look so young? It happened a few nights ago. I was on my way to get a cup of water when I heard a loud thud coming from my grandfather's room. I was worried that something fell over, so I went to go check. When I opened the door, I found him collapsed on the ground. I rushed to help him, but when I did, he looked so different. He wore the same clothes that my grandpa wore that night. And his face, I, I recognized his face. He looked younger. So many things were rushing through my head at that moment, and yet I knew he felt familiar to me. I know it sounds bizarre the more I talk about it, but that's what happened. That was also the same night I found the letter. It was next to him, already opened. I'm sorry again for all of this. No matter who I went to, they either said something was wrong with me or my family. Everything going on, maybe they were right. Pools of water, the letter, Louis, now this. I've been ignoring the signs for years and just blindly hoping things could get better if I tried finding solutions on my own, but that's not enough anymore. Maybe my family is really cursed. No, they're not. Curses aren't real. <laughs> you Curses aren't real. My brother in Christ, her grandfather is younger than you now. What are you talking about? You, you literally have voices in your head talking to you. Um, I'm sorry, curses aren't real. Can you, can you be, can you like, just stop spreading this information? The detective? 
I, I think we easily get too involved in believing that sort of thing exists. And truth, the ones who fixate on it make it their reality. Welcome to the curse zone. Only curses inside anime girls. Rumors, doubts, lies, all of these things are what they want to become real. Deep-rooted emotions like that can't possibly be healed or fixed right away. But like a curse, these emotions drag other people down with them. What? Personally, I think you were caught up in all of this. But I assure you, we'll see this through. For you and Mr. Mortimer. What? Thank you. Good. Now, our first priority is find more, uh, uh, find out more about Louis. Nina, the letter you showed us back at the agency, do you have it with you? Uh, yes, it, it's here. Do you mind if I borrow it for a bit? I'll be sure to give it back. Of course, but what are you going to do with it? I searched everything in that letter and I still couldn't come up with clues. Ah, I'll be using it as a reference, or a guide if you will. I'm afraid I can't discuss too much of the process, trade secret and all. Ha 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 ha. Uh, of course. Dude, Hugo's acting really weird. I'll check upstairs. Noah, you and Ch Colby check the ground floor. Got it. Winky face. Before they leave to do their own investigation, Hugo grabs hold of Noah's shoulder. Leans in close. Close enough for Nina not to hear. You want some fucking sucky sucky in the upstairs shower? Keep a close eye on Mr. Mortimer and Nina. Especially Nina. I don't want her to be dragged anymore than she already is. So whatever happens, keep her safe. Hugo, you... Fine. But remember, yell for me, okay? I know. Thank you, Noah. I'm counting on you. You too, boy. Woof. The final nod of them, Hugo then goes towards the staircase and heads upstairs. Noah stares for a moment longer at Hugo's back before, the, before he disappears into the first floor. He then turns to look at Colby. Well, it's time to get to work. Right, Colby? Woof. Investigation start. The objective is to look around the area for objects to proceed story. Use the arrows or the arrow keys to move to a different area. Outlines will appear on clickable objects. On the top right is the hint button. Clicking it will highlight an object that you've missed. Okay, well... Mr. Mort oh, so we're playing as Noah now, okay. Mr. Mortimer still sits motionless by the corner, his gaze never leaving the ring. Um, is that it? Come on, click. Oh, woof, woof. Woof, woof. Very good. Old rotary dial telephone. Looks like it's still in good use. A delicate arrangement of violets and white roses. They seem to be fresh and fairly new. A large bookshelf stands close to the entryway. It contains a couple of photo albums and a few phone books. So why don't you do something about it then? Oh, now I can set. I couldn't click that before. Frames decorating the walls are covered in white sheets, veiled with a thin lining of dust on top of each one. Wow, there's so many paintings covering the walls. Are there more like this all over the house? Yes, uh, my grandfather commissioned commissioned many back in the day, but sadly, he doesn't do that anymore. You know, I can't help but noticing the paintings are covered. How come? I did that. I covered them up for my grandfather's sake. For his sake? Yes, um, he was pretty obsessed with them, you see. There were times when he would mutter to himself or just stare at the paintings for days on end. It worried me so much I had to cover them all. Since then, he hasn't stared at any of them. He just sits quietly, looking outside. Mm, I see. About the paintings, I also noticed they all have a similar theme. They all have water in them. I know this isn't a coincidence since you told us before, but if there's anything you know, anything at all, then please tell me. N Noah, can I ask you a question first? Oh, sure, go ahead. Do you believe in mermaids? <laughs> what? Do you, believe, do you believe mermaids? Mermaids? I don't suppose I do. Um, why? Casting her gaze to the floor, Nina anxiously fidgets and tightly clasps her hands together. Then briefly sighs and continues. Well, there's this story, or more like a fairy tale, that my family has passed down. A fairy tale? Yes, well, it feels like one to me. 
It was about a fisherman who fell in love with a mermaid. Every day and night, he would go out by the shore to gaze at her beauty. But one day she vanished, leaving him confused and heartbroken. Determined, he would sail many seas for a chance to see her again. Sailing from coast to coast, new lands beyond and back he would go. But long after, fortune followed him all throughout his journey, made him one of the most wealthy, one of the wealthiest and most highly respected in his village. However, despite all the wealth he'd gained through his travels, he never found the mermaid again. She would only be a dream and nothing more. Yeah, no, exactly. That's what I'm thinking, dear. And that's the end of the story. It doesn't end happily, but I guess that there's a lesson behind all of it. I just never understood it. What do you think happened to the mermaid? I know it's an exaggeration, and yet I can't help but wonder. Hmm, it's hard to say. I just feel bad for the both of them. To be honest with you, I'm not a fan of sad endings. But with me, I'd wish the fisherman and mermaid could see each other again. Oh, clicked out of the window again. Very smart. I'm a smart boy. Or at least that's what I think. Even if they weren't meant to be with each other? Yeah, I think so, at least. I wouldn't want to imagine going through a journey all by myself. It's hard being alone. A journey all by yourself. Which half is on the top? Oh my god. Reverse mermaid. 11.30pm. Holy shit, that's so much later. So what the hell's going on? Okay, after searching vigorously through each of the rooms, he knew his findings would eventually lead him here. This is it. Hugo walks towards the nearest lampshade and turns it on. Dimly illuminated, illuminated, he sees the extent of how lavish this part of the house is. From the customized window drapes to the vintage furnishings, everything here exudes that extravagance. But much like the interior Hugo had seen so far, he finds this one in particular reeks of it. Plastered from wall to wall, a gloom lingers, as if the room itself is moldering despite its preserved nature. Reverse cowgirl's better, why not reverse mermaid? Bad. Uh, Alright, well, let's start on this side. We got a photo frame. Ow. Oh, old photo of a lost time. A sweet summertime memory of a little girl, her beloved grandfather. Top the fireplace, unblemished and unmarked by time, hangs a curious and familiar painting of a beautiful woman floating on the water. Scattered pieces of paper, all forgotten, lie waiting on the cold floor. Heavily etched markings are found scrawled all over the papers. Um, tea set? A pristine pearl white tea set sits patiently by, untouched and unused for quite some time. A leather bound journal rests on the edge of the table. Its pages are torn out haphazardly, that the binding itself is starting to fall out. Fallout? Is that a Fallout reference? Is that a Fallout reference? Meticulously organized set of academic books, ranging from non-fiction to geography, are all on display. However, hidden away behind the vast collection are some children's fairy tales, all carefully kept. And then chest. A classic wooden chest lies at the foot of the canopy bed. Its lock still firmly holds, safeguarding whatever is inside. I need to hurry. I don't want to stay here for too long. Fifty minutes later! Smith prefers regular cowgirl confirmed? Yeah, duh. Reverse cowgirl leads to the most penile injuries. He searches and searches and still there is no sign of Louis. To Hugo, even if there is a fragment, a singular thread to that person, to their real selves, he could find them. But there is nothing. Not one thing pertaining to him. It's as if the thought of Louis barely exists at all. What's going on? My lord, he looks very angry. I clearly sensed that presence from before, but it's gone again. Damn it, I wish I had more time. No, calm down. It has to be here. I just need to focus. He ponders again, retracing every step and every little detail, hoping that he overlooked something. Exactly, and as we already established, it wouldn't be a spiff stream without penile injuries. Oh my god. And way less thrust leverage. I thought you were gay. Come on, man. I can't believe you straight. You like women? That's disgusting. Yet all he knows is that the one tangible thing that connects him, that tethers so close to the space, and most of all to Henry, is the letter. 
Words of promise, of love, all delicately etched onto a page, but tainted with a powerful and dark emotion, emotion that has been festering for too long. You, very stray, sadly. Boo! No, that's fair. A straight? In our stream? How could it be? From the very start of all this, Hugo believed that whoever Louis was, they were the ones responsible. He thought he could find them and convince them to stop their haunting for good. To bring peace, bring them peace and to move on. However, this isn't the case anymore. The unnatural force that binds everyone so close to the other in this family is not the cause of the angry spirit. No, it's something far more devious than that. And Dia still sent you here? Yeah, I can't believe Dia is friends with non-gay people. Truly despicable. Father, forgive me, for I have brought her straight without thinking. Despicable! No, I am joking and I love you all. Even if you do... Do straight things, like... Have sexual intercourse in a hetero way. As he takes the letter out from the envelope, he notices a change within. Bearing no foreboding threat at the bottom of the page, it looks just like a regular letter, or rather, what it once was. A sad and tragic love. <laughs> if you can't come, then I understand. Things have gotten more complicated with your mother ever since she found out about us, right? I'm sorry, Henry, for everything. It hurts to see you so torn up like this. I would never hurt you or drag you along with me. If this is to be our farewell, then, I c then can I ask for one last favor? Could you keep my locket? I know this is selfish of me, but I'd like for you to have it. And I'd be happy to know it was safe with you. My heart will forever be yours, Henry. With love always, Louis. So this was the true letter? A small warmth emanates from the paper, wrapping closely around his finger. Fingers, quiet and soothing. Told you it was Yowie? Oh lord. One last wish, eat my ass! The fragment Hugo was searching for. Louis, I'm sorry. You are also a victim in all of this too. Please, if you can hear me, I need your help. Without warning, the sound of a click can be heard across the bedroom, as if something unlocked itself. Yuka turns his head towards the sound and sees the chest. Unlike the other furniture, its dark and rustic features have not been maintained well, left to rot on its own. Suddenly, he stops at the sound of a voice, a sweet voice whispering to him, beckoning him towards the fireplace. Come here, my dear sweet boy. Um, sure, go to the painting. Oh, hey, it's this painting. There mounted by the fireplace is a painting of a beautiful woman floating on the water. Her pale skin is incandescent, brilliantly prominent against the contrast of the dark, murky waters that keep her hidden, keep her bound to the canvas. Hugo stares intensely at the picture. An emphatic sorrow swells within him disarming his very senses and forcing him to inch closer, surrendering himself to the sweet song. Poor thing, how lonely you must feel. You are a lot like him, like Henry. As Hugo approaches closer and closer to the painting and his mind screaming to run, he sees it. He can finally see beyond the facade the lady portrays for what the painting truly is. But don't worry, I can take away that sadness. A deformed creature, a mermaid, floats above the surface. The voice whispers, large hollow eyes stare back, boring deeply into his eyes. Her skin is melting, bleeding heavily, this black ichor, as it gushes out from the canvas. Some of it starts to hit, not only the floor, but, on, but at Hugo as well. The black viscous tar clings persistently onto him, unrelentless, as they continue to pile up. And then he feels it, what drew him in initially to this thing. A deep sense of longing rushes through him, snuffing out what little control he had left, finally embracing this nature to come home. Take my hand. Without hesitation, Hugo reaches out his hand while his body leans in closer to the mermaid. She grabs and pulls him in. Not once looking back, 
He dives and follows after her, returning to nothing. Bad end. Okay. My bad. Uh, don't go to the painting. No, stay focused, Hugo. I won't let it get to me. And there came the snuff. Yikes. Preparing himself, he heads towards the chance and opens it. Inside, scrambled together are bunches of notebooks and small trinkets. Hugo continues to rummage through when he stumbles across an old newspaper article. Young man found dead by the lake. What? But what if the painting provides the good suck? Oh my god. How deep are we into the yaoi? I don't know. I don't actually know how much longer this game goes on for. But I'm, I'm interested. I like it very much so far. An unidentified young man was found on the morning of XXXXXXXX. That's the pawn day. Three days prior to his death, according to the police. It was like maybe halfway? Yeah, I think we're probably about halfway. Ruled as a suicide, police have claimed that the troubled youth drowned himself. This certainly is a tragic loss, an unfortunate event indeed. XXXX comments. No claim on his body has yet been made. Louis. By the corner of Hugo's eye, he spots a bright glint buried beneath the clutter. He reaches for it. Wait, it is actually Yaoi! They're gay lovers! Yeah! You guys were right! He reaches for it. A locket of brilliant gold shines unblemished, retaining a timeless luster. Inside it safeguards a picture of a young man with glasses, smiling brilliantly. Did I only realize that now? Yes! I'm stupid! I, I thought the whole, even though your family doesn't approve, I thought that was because it was a mermaid. <laughs> you were only half joking this entire time. I thought, we, I thought it was because it was a mermaid, not because it was gay sex. This must be the locket that he was talking about. It's so pretty. I'm surprised it still shines like this. Oh, sweet summer child. And this picture, did he put this here? No, it might have been Henry. But why would he store it away like this? What should I do? We we'll definitely take the locket. There, there. I should probably hold on to this for now. Take it to him. Please. Louis? A gentle but distant plea echoes in Hugo's heart. A forgotten ache of yearning and regret grips him deeply. Feelings not of his own start to rise like small ripples on a pond. Wanting to be found again and remembered. Don't worry, I'll bring it to him. I'll make sure of it. Hugo's about to, put, about to put everything back in the chest when he feels a wet and cold sensation crawling up his leg. What? Water? A pool of water rest, relentlessly spreads across the floor, already seeping into the chest. Damn it, no! I. Suddenly, the lights shut off. A scream is heard, followed by a myriad of shouts. Hugo's about to call out to Noah but stops at the sight of pale feet before him. Looming over him stands a tall and ominous figure. His face is shrouded in complete darkness, devoid of any human emotion. It appears as a young man, but Hugo knows that it's far from it. No, this very thing is trying to imitate a human form. Trying to be human, Hugo could only stare back. Paralyzed with fear, he is forced to watch the horror as it cl slowly creeps towards him. It's just like before, the sensation of someone staring at him from within. But this time, it's drawing nearer, inching ever so closely. The words to call out to Colby or, or Noah fail to reach out. Lodged in his throat, he struggles in pain. With his breathing shallow, he tries to force his body to move. And then it stops. Looking down at Hugo, filled with nothing but malice and contempt, it speaks. Don't get in my way. All of a sudden, the door to the bedroom door slams shut, and the entity disappears. The tension from his body finally releases its agonizing grip, and he gasps desperately for all for, for air. 
His vision blurs and his breathing haggard. He staggers, he staggers towards the door. He yanks at the handle several, several times, but it's tightly jammed. Fuck! <laughs> it all makes sense now. It all makes sense now. I can't read anymore. The fish scent is just natural. I excuse you. Noah, Colby! To his dismay, he's only greeted with silence at the other end of the door. Damn it! From a distance, he faintly hears the sounds of Colby's relentless barking as he gets further away from the house. Hugo rushes towards the window. He tries to pry it open, but just like the door, heavy force prevents him from doing so. Like being underwater. If moves, his movements slow and drawn out, as if being dragged down by that thing. Fuck this! Frantically looking around the room, he spots a nearby chair. Without a moment sooner, uh, Hugo grabs the chair and starts to strike the window. Bit by bit, the window cracks, gets larger with each blow, splintering off smaller pieces. The hell is this thing made out of? Still trying to catch his breath, he musters all the strength he has left for a final blow. Damn you, just break already! Clearing out the remaining glass shards, Hugo peers his head out to see any reading he can grab hold of. However, he discovers instead that the wall adjacent is covered in ivy. Despite how heavy the rain has drastically become, he reaches out for it, grabbing a handful of the vines. Carefully, he climbs out of the window, gripping tightly and making sure he doesn't lose his footing. Yet to his luck, the patch of vine he clutches start to tear away from the wall. Out of desperation, he struggles to find a grip on the other, on another, but fails when his hands slip out of reach. Shit! Clamoring wildly as he loses his grip on the ivy, he crash lands down onto a thicket of bushes. Air forced out of him, he heaves uncontrollably, trying to even out his breathing. But even that is laborious. An immense pain spreads across not only his back, but his entire body. God, I'm getting too old for this. Bro, you're like 20. What are you... F fuck, fuck off. Although his body screams out in pain, he forces himself up. There's still time. I, I can do this. I have to. With staggering feet and haggard breathing, he makes his way to the place where it all started. To the lake where this tragedy starts and ends. Wait, what about the other people? Is he just... Where the... Where the lake. Head first into the bush, my kind of guy. Oh my word. I think if he went head first, he probably would have died. Finally entering, finally entering through the park, Hugo calls out to Colby and Noah. Colby! Noah! Where are you? He hears faintly the sounds of barking and echoes of people yelling in the distance. He rushes towards the echoes, guiding him through the downpour. With his heart racing and blood rushing to his head, he finds his way to the lake. Drawing closer, he sees Nina giving chase to her grandfather. Unfortunately, she doesn't get too far, as Noah stops her. Grandpa, uh, stop! Grandpa! Let me go! Grandpa, he's... No, Nina, it's dangerous. You'll get hurt too. I don't care, I... I don't want to lose anyone anymore. And it's at that instant Hugo trudges against the water, pursuing in Nina's stead. H Hugo? No, don't! Please fall deaf to his ears. Not even the whines and worried cries of his partner can make him turn back. Determined, he forges ahead. Nearing the deep end of the lake, he sees Henry Mortimer gazing directly at the abyss. He looks even more frail and disheveled than before. It's as if all his life he's lived up until this point has begun to fray, draining every ounce of himself and surrendering it all to the lake. Before Henry could lean in, Hugo reaches out and tugs at his arm. Mr. Mortimer, listen to me. Nothing is waiting for you down there. Please, come back to the shore with me. Motionless and unresponsive, he stares deeply into the water. The haze over his eyes is still obscure and persistent. There are so many things we cannot afford to lose in our lives, and you're one of them. To Nina, you're all she has left. She needs you, Mr. Mortimer. Hugo felt it. A slight jolt from Henry's arm, as if stirred by the mention of Nina. He slowly turns to face Hugo. Nina. However, just as cruel and violent as the storm, Henry jerks back, wrenching his arm away from Hugo's hold on him. No. All of this is my fault. If, 
if only I got to Louis sooner, then none of this would have happened. He was waiting for me. He was patient with me. And yet for all the things he's done, I chose my family over him. He's gone because I didn't pick him. Henry backs further away from the shoreline. Uh, Mr. Mortimer! His manic eyes never straying away from Hugo as he keeps his distance from him. Louis, I'm sorry. I was the one who dragged you into this. You deserved so much more. And I wished... Henry struggles over his words. He clasps tightly to his shirt, his throat dry and taut from all that he had bottled up. From all those repressed, repressed and silent years of just waiting, waiting for the curse to finally take him. I wish I had gone with you that night, Louis. Sir, uh, even if you still covet that wish, it wouldn't resolve anything. Not for you or Louis. I... I read what he wrote to you those years ago. He understood if you didn't want to come see him. But the thing is, Mr. Mortimer, Louis never thought anything less of you. He said so in his letters to you. His letters? For the longest time, I wanted to believe he hated me for that, resented me for the choice. Or at least, I thought it was easier for me to think that way. How long has it been since I talked with him? It's been too long, sir. But that's why you don't have to shoulder all this pain by yourself anymore. We can talk about it. Me and you, the person you've just met. I don't- I don't have- don't worry about it, we can talk about it. But you and Louis, all of it, together. Hugo extends not only his hand to him, but a promise. Oh, look, his eyes are not glowing anymore. A promise that Henry has yearned for so long. A way to forgive himself. He hesitates at first. What fool believes in a deserved forgiveness? Such a thing doesn't exist. And yet, despite everything, Hugo still reaches out to him. To a stranger. Maybe he can be forgiven. Just as he was about to reach out for Hugo, a hand slithers around Henry's instead. Oh my god. Its arms unnaturally contort around him while its head perches on his shoulder. This thing, this Louis, is no longer pretending to be human. With piercing cold green eyes, it stares directly at Hugo, mocking him cursing him, wishing nothing but despair. We can be saved. We can be forgiven. You like it? It gives hugs? Hot. Oh my god. There is only one true way out of this. I will share with you the most happiest of endings. Before Hugo could reach out for Henry's hand, he disappears into the water. Mr. Mr. Mortimer! Without hearing the anguished cries and desperate pleas, Hugo dives after him into the abyss. It's green for green flag? What, green? Green? Who doesn't love a happy ending? I don't think this is a happy ending. Plunging into icy waters, Hugo feels shocks running rampart through his body. Green radioactive anxiety hugs? Those are my favorite. Like spice continually piercing from his legs to the tips of his fingers, fiercely and unyielding. His chest tightens as his heart races as he begins to kick his legs, hoping whichever way he goes, he'll find his way to Henry. Swimming deeper and deeper in, he sees faintly a figure slowly descending into the darkness. As he finally gets closer to Henry, long snake-like arms stretch across the void and grab Hugo's neck, violently squeezing all of the air out from him. He tries desperately to wrench its hands away, but with, but with each struggle, Hugo's movements begin to weigh heavier and heavier. Louis, where are you, Louis? It's looking for Louis? Digging deep into his coat pockets, he grew No! A hail! Fuck! 
grasped tightly in his hand the locket that Henry kept and had long forgotten, holding it out as it shines ever so brightly in the dark. Ah, there you are. He's pulling his cock out! You fuckers. It releases his grip on Hugo and instead reaches out for the locket. Taking this as a chance, he drops the chain and kicks with all of his might to grab uh, Henry's arm. With his heart and body screaming in pain, he swims desperately to the surface. Almost there. I just have to. As the lights from the surface begin to blur, Hugo makes one last attempt to reach for it. With his whim limbs, whims, with his limbs worn out and his energy spent, this is all he can do. Before he loses his consciousness, he notices a figure swimming towards them, getting closer and closer, and then everything fades to black. Drifting along with what feels like an endless sea, Hugo courses through wave after wave, not knowing where he's going or caring for that matter. All he knows is that he's Two very, hours later. very tired. Hale, you shut up. You shouldn't be laughing, but you're wheezing. With his rim worn out? No, you few people. How long has it been since he's had a good night's rest? Ah, uh, it's been too long. Maybe I should take that rest now. I like that so much. I agree that you deserve it, but not here. What? Uh, I'm sorry for startling you. I just wanted to see you one last time before I go. Louis? You've done so much for me and Henry. It is Louis, by the way. Hello, Ariana. I can't thank you enough. No worries. No worries. Good shit, champ. Good no worries. I want to thank you, too, for watching over me, and also I wanted to apologize for my remarks from before. I really thought I had things figured out once I found you, but you know how they turned out for me. <laughs> Made it for story time? Yeah. It's all right, really. After all this time, I didn't think anyone could hear me. Especially Henry. Louis. I was worried about him for a long time. I always wanted to keep me away from his personal struggles. I keep clicking out of the fucking window and it's gonna kill me. To keep me safe from them. But I was too stubborn for my own good. Honestly, I don't regret it. Any of it. Even if I could no longer reach out to Henry. Fate weaved its thread back to you, our tangent, connecting us once more to this very moment. And for that, I am forever grateful to you, Hugo. You're welcome, Louis. From a far off distance, Hugo hears a voice crying out to him, beckoning for him to return. Well, they're waiting for you. I guess they really are, huh? Take care always, Hugo. You too, Louis. Like... Sex sighting? Bad. With his eyes closed and his senses still returning, he feels the constant tugs and licks of a certain bloodhound, whining as he tries to wake up his partner. Hugo! He also hears another familiar voice, too annoyingly close for comfort. Eyes shot right open, he jerks up. Confused, Hugo looks around before he cups, coughs up the remaining water in his lungs. You alright? Noah starts to pat his back while Kobe continues to whine over Hugo. What happened? Where's Mr. Mortimer? He's safe. So is Nina. They're, they're both okay. The police and the ambulance should be arriving soon. Hmm. Thank goodness. Isn't there more you have to say to me? Instead of thank goodness? I swear, you don't listen to a damn word I say. Uh, I'm sorry, Noah. Exhausted, he lets out a sigh. And then continues to pat Hugo's back aggressively when someone approaches them. Detective Lawrence? Oh, Nina. There's someone I'd want you to meet. Is he old again? Oh, he is. Behind her stands an elderly man. Frail in stature, he timidly looks to the side pensively as he ponders to himself. Though his youth has long faded, his eyes are what catches Hugo's attention. They're no longer a piercing and vicious green. Only eyes just like Nina's. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. Detective? I never got the chance to say goodbye to him. I always thought about it every day. What if Louis lived on in this world? What if he stayed a little longer with me? 
It's because of that constant mindset that dragged everyone down. And I kept hurting not only me, but Nina especially. I was the one who kept hurting her. The one to blame for all of this. But you, someone that I've never met, still went out of your way to save me. Not knowing my burdens or my faults. Thank you. Hugo reaches out to Henry and smiles brightly at him. It's my pleasure, sir. That'll be two hundred dollars. But before Hugo lets go, Henry tugs at Hugo's hand one last time. I hope that someday you too will overcome it. What? The next day. That's a weird place. Well, good morning, Hugo. You're bright and early. Mm, morning. With much fervor and haste, Hugo resumes writing on his notepad. Although by closer inspection, he looks like he's going to combust any minute. Are you writing up the report? Without looking up, Hugo responds back. Yeah, for the most part. Just need to write yours too. I will, since I haven't had breakfast yet, and I don't like eating by myself. Let me guess. Two's better than one. Bingo! Wow, Hugo, you're really catching on. I'm so proud of you. Let's have gay sex. Ah, oh, shut it, will you? I swear, if I hadn't fallen off for the, from that goddamn window, maybe my report would have been shorter. Before Noah could begin to cut the bacon, he pauses at the mention of Hugo's report. Oh, yeah, by the way, am I telling me what happened to the Mortimer's window? Um, I broke it. Well, that's obvious to me. What I don't understand is, why is it broken? Do you know how much it costs to repair a window like that? I, I know, I know, it was really dumb of me, but I was literally trapped in like a hellscape of like water and drowning and there was a weird creature thing. What was the creature? I don't know, I'm sorry. Besides, I told Mr. Mortimer and my, about it before we left. Uh, but yours isn't short at all now, is it? Grabs crotch? Oh my god. Honestly, I was expecting an earful from him, and also the bill, and, surprisingly enough, he said it was okay. Lucky for us, right? So what, you just call it a day after that? Thank you so much, Mr. Mortimer. You broke it, you pay for it. Would you chill? Of course I'll pay for it. But each time I kept insisting, he shrugged it off. Said that we already went through a lot for them, so this was nothing in comparison. Ugh, you know what? He's right. After all we went through, we deserve at least a nap. But before he could walk away, he stops and sees a familiar person walking towards the storefront, carrying something with her. Speaking of water and being wet, do you know that in terms of- oh god. Good morning, you two. There's barely a foot through the door, a certain bloodhound stirs up from his resting spot and makes his way towards Neil, tail uncontrollably wagging. Ah, good morning to you too, Colby. Neil scratches behind one of Colby's ears, making his right foot unconsciously move on its own. Stretching an invisible but desirable spot for him. Good morning, Miss Nina. Morning. What brings you here this time? Is everything alright with your grandfather? Yes, he's doing pretty well, actually. No! Even better than before. We talked so much last night, I hardly slept at all. But honestly, it's been a while since I last spoke to him so freely like that. I hardly felt tired at all. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, that There's something else I wanted to ask uh, the both of you for. But a bluntly... I need your help. You two aren't busy. I'd like some company eating these. Inside a clear plastic bag are a stack of two boxes placed on top of one another. She opens the box on top to reveal a colorful array of neatly decorated donuts all lined perfectly. No cramped or squished spaces. A work of art in Hugo's eyes. Wow, so pretty. D donuts! They look so, so delicious! Destroy those rings. I'm more than happy to eat those with you, Nina. <laughs> well, there he goes again with his donuts. Freaking cops and their donuts. I tell you, I keep clicking out of the window. It gets really easy to click out the window, okay? But yes, please join us, Miss Nina. We're about to have breakfast too. Weren't we, Kuya? Mm. Always so brazen in front of others. You do make it especially easy for me. Ugh. Hehe. <laughs> you both have such great chemistry with each other. On second thought, I'm way too tired for this. I'm going to have to apologize in advance for this, Nisa, Nina. But truthfully, I've been running on last night's coffee and I'm about to pass out any minute now. <laughs> no worries. Honestly, I think a little break time sounds like what we all need right now. Thanks. 
Hugo puts down his pen and proceeds to head for the couch. Kobe follows after them. These donuts got them boys blushing. Would you like to join us, Miss Nina? I would love to. Wait, hold on a second. Wait, why are they all going to the couch? I guess we save these for later then. Yes, yes, please do. Ah, come on, it's nap time. Noah sighs heavily before setting down the food on his desk. He then gestures Nina towards the sofa, which she happily takes his offer and joins them? Oh, I thought they were all just gonna sleep on top of each other in a pile on the sofa. What? No, it's not the casting couch. Ugh, I'm getting old. I mean, you are old. Shut it. Hee <laughs> hee. This, this is really nice. Oh, good boy, Colby. Come here. Nina quietly coos at him and begins to scratch the back of Colby's ears once more. Hugo leans a little closer to Noah, his voice above a whisper, but close enough for Noah to only hear him. You know, I'm glad that you came along yesterday. Oh, what's this? Are you getting chummy with me now? All a chummy, whatever, but I really mean it. You hadn't saved us back there. Like I told you before, I'll be there whenever you get yourself into reckless shit. Besides, you didn't say... Besides, I didn't say this was nap time. Get some rest. You deserve it. You you too. Again, I clicked out of the window. I'm going to shoot myself. Calming silence fills the room as they bask under the morning glow. No big parties or celebrations. Just each other's company and sharing the small reward. A small and warm comfort. Good end. Case closed. Well, there we go. That was... Stillwater. That was not at all the game I was expecting. Um, and then they fucked. Yes, and then they fucked. That was not at all the game I was expecting. And it also, like, it was very good. The art style was fantastic. You can you can really tell that whoever made this game put a lot of um, effort into the art, and it shows. The story at times was a, at times was a little weird. It almost feels like rushed. It felt like the story was a little rushed. I feel like there was parts of it that just kind of happened and then the next part happened immediately after. And also like that one, that like creepy dude whose feet we could see, where did that go? I don't really know. I don't know. I feel like this could have been twice as long and that would have been perfect. Um, I think they had story points they wanted to hit but didn't know how to get between them. No, exactly that. I still think it was a very good game. Like, this is definitely one of the better HIO games, and it's free. Um, the music was good, the art style was good, the story was pretty good. I'd give the story like a 6 out of 10. With, it could have been like a 9 out of 10 if they just gave themselves like an extra hour or an extra two hours. Um, and the only, and hey, no porn. And the only other thing I wanted to say is, I mean, it's a visual novel, so there's not really much gain to be had. But it would have been nice if there was like, more of an actual game system to to like do something with um but fantastic game really really good i enjoyed that